All right, you may go ahead and proceed, please. Good. So thank you, Tammy, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're located. So my name is Ilya Yusfi. I'm from the Viewers Company. And I'm part of the sales and consulting uh, department of the company. Uh, um, I'm taking care of the uh, consulting of the solution and also of the, of the sales part. So uh, today's uh, topic will be around ontologies. So and um, specifically how they benefit to uh, merging models and documents into one single source of truth. Um, I'm going to present some use cases that show how ontologies can help uh, digitalizing and, uh, and enabling uh, smart systems engineering. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, regarding questions, what I can, uh, what we can do is that you can write your questions uh, during the presentations and there will be a slot for Q&A at the end. So if you have more questions in the end, you can also ask your questions in, uh, in, at this moment. And then if you have, uh, if, if there are too many questions, then we can uh, also uh, see, uh, if you can send uh, me the email and, uh, and we can treat them uh, uh, offline. So just to uh, recap the content, I will be introducing the, the Reuse company uh, um, before talking about the, the topic of today, the ontologies. And then I'm going to show you the use cases and the different benefits that we can uh, have from using ontologies uh, uh, for systems engineering. So uh, first, let me uh, give you some words about the company. So the Reese company was uh, established in 1999 as a spin-off of a university uh, in Madrid, in Spain, where I'm uh, located right now. Uh, the company is combining staff of, of, of systems and software engineering, and uh, also combining uh, people in the company and also a close collaboration with uh, researchers at, at the university. So as I said, the headquarters uh, are in Madrid, so where I am right now. We have also international offices in Stockholm, a delegation in uh, Japan, and we are planning to open a new office. So this was a bit delayed with the pandemic, but the idea was to open an office in the US, and we are uh, plan planning to do it this year, uh, hopefully. And regarding the mission of, uh, so basically what we are doing this uh, uh, for, it is uh, to offer what we call a knowledge-centric approach. I'm going to describe this uh, a bit later. Uh, as the main message of the of the presentation. So this is our office in Madrid, as I told you. And if you want to see in the geographical uh, view where we are uh, operating, so we have uh, our headquarters in Madrid, we have the partners and the uh, uh, headquarters also in the in offices around the world. And you see basically that we are uh, operating uh, all over the globe. We see you see that we have uh, so these numbers basically just to give you a, a big picture of what uh, of, of who we are, and uh, basically the message here is enabling smart systems engineering. So this is uh, the um, the key. Um, so this is what defines our activities. So when we started, so those who know us uh, have probably heard about our. Uh, approach to tackle quality assessment through uh, implementing the INCOSI guide for writing requirements rules into a set of metrics in our tools. And basically this is uh, part of our core uh, activities, which are, um, let's say, um, recapped by the TRC acronym. So TR and the Q uh, as uh, for quality in, uh, in Spanish, which is spelled with, with a C. But today what we are doing is uh, trying to cover uh, more and more systems engineering activities. And basically, if you want to uh, keep in mind what we are doing in, in one sentence, what we do is providing solutions to uh, digitalize the activities around the system development lifecycle. And one key component of this digitalization and uh, leveraging of system engineering activities is the ontology. So uh, without uh, further uh, delay, I'm going to introduce the the topic of today, the ontology. So ontologies had a uh, general uh, philosophical concept definition uh, when it started uh, in the 17th century uh, as the study of the nature of human existence. But today's concept is, a, is an IT concept, which basically is uh, the way we have to uh, define 
uh, what we have and what we need to understand uh, our world. So basically how we organize and how we structure knowledge. And this is what we need to uh, operate our uh, different activities uh, around the, all along the life cycle. So um, the, more, the, more, the more complex the systems become and the more uh, sources we get to describe the system in the different uh, processes of the, of the, of the V uh, model. And this means that we uh, have a growing challenge of um, merging information of different kinds into a, a single representation uh, model. And this is what we are trying to do with ontologies. Uh, it means that uh, this drivetrain uh, structure could come from a modeling tool. And this, uh, the structure of the car with this uh, system and subsystems can, can be exported from a, a Word document or a PDF. And what we want to do is that all this information could be seen in one single view in a common language. So this is what we will do with uh, ontologies. I will explain this uh, small uh, figure a bit later. And uh, as I mentioned also in the, in the previous slide, uh, we uh, want to use ontologies to uh, smartly sail the V process and uh, use this as a compass. So ontologies are a very powerful compass because they have more than four uh, cardinal points. You could uh, use ontologies to reach uh, high level requirements or to use, uh, use ontologies to, uh, to set up a digital thread uh, in your activities or uh, and enhance traceability. So you have many uh, applications, but just to focus on uh, requirements uh, first, what you could do with ontologies is uh, extract and identify requirements from documents, uh, as I showed uh, earlier of a different kind. You could then classify these requirements to uh, automatically uh, um, uh, speed and to speed up the process for uh, tender, uh, tender offers. So you, you will see an example of this in one of the use cases. And uh, then uh, the requirements engineer can uh, use this information, this classified um, organized structure of requirements to uh, define patterns that will be uh, the standardized uh, templates for, uh, for future uses. So you have to reuse this information for, uh, for other uh, purposes. And the, uh, the idea with the patterns as well is to uh, reach a high level of quality by, uh, by providing a, a good syntax for all the requirements. So basically this could be one of the uh, um, objectives that, that you could reach with ontologies. Another one uh, could be uh, to enhance traceability. So first of all, you can uh, trace requirements at uh, different levels of abstraction and also automatically derive or allocate requirements to uh, uh, subsystems or to uh, derive or, or realize the requirements uh, in the text uh, in the model. So populating uh, models from the requirements using the, the patterns to uh, generate uh, blocks, um, a actors, activities, functions from the text. And then you can also uh, apply this to simulation with the end uh, objective of digitalizing the whole uh, process. So um, as I said in the beginning, knowledge centric systems engineering is what we are uh, um, planning to do. Uh, so putting knowledge uh, in the center uh, of all systems engineering activities. And this uh, is made by ontologies, which are basically represented in five uh, different uh, layers. The first one is vocabulary. So you just have a list of terms that you define uh, for your project. And you can also uh, uh, use ontologies uh, at different levels. So you can use ontologies uh, to import into other ontologies. We have a leveling uh, with the libraries. So uh, these uh, vocabulary then can be uh, structured with uh, relationships, so relationships of uh, um, a product breakdown structure, of, of um, relationships of, um, of uh, glossaries, for example, uh, synonyms, uh, relationships of functions, so any kind of relationship you could establish between uh, different terms. And then you use patterns to uh, use these uh, first layers to, to build up um, a good structure for the requirements. And these patterns can be used to understand our, uh, our requirements in, in the text. For example, understand relationships, induce uh, properties from the, from the text or the opposite. You can also use patterns to produce properties. I will show you also an example in the uh, use cases. 
And finally, you use all this information to reason and, uh, and create rules, for example, quality rules. I will come, come to it when, uh, um, when uh, reminding about the, the quality rules that we implement uh, from, the, from the INCOSI guide for matching requirements. So just to conclude about the concept of ontology, some people would say the truth is in the models because uh, this is what is closest to the uh, design and uh, the low level of, um, of definition of the components. We won't uh, agree with that. Some people would say the truth is in the text because the first, uh, the first documents established in the, in the process are being done uh, in text. We won't agree with that as well. We would say the, tr the truth is in the ontology. So this knowledge can come both from text and models. The ontology can be uh, gathered in uh, either uh, modeling tools or other textual sources. And the idea is to have this knowledge uh, blended in real time so that we guarantee the consistency between both sides of the, uh, of, the um, of knowledge. And uh, with the final, uh, with the final uh, objective to have a single source uh, of truth. So ontologies as a main, uh, as a main reference, as a main, uh, as a fundamental uh, object to uh, guarantee the digital thread and sale the V model, as I, as I said. So um, I'm going to list here some uh, benefits of uh, ontologies um, to merge text and models, but also to merge different texts of different uh, kinds coming from different actors, uh, stakeholders in the, in, the, in the development of a system. So this is a short list of the, of the benefits. You can think of more um, if uh, you uh, extend this to other uh, activities. But here I'm going to treat this, uh, these six uh, um, benefits, I, I would say. So these will be the use cases that we'll be presenting uh, afterwards. So first, you, uh, you can define a common framework for system engineering activities. So you can basically uh, have a common um, vocabulary, um, let's say source, and uh, the patterns, as I said, can be used for quality management to help writing new requirements to, to perform VMV. So this ontology will be the, uh, the central um, reference for knowledge for any activity in, in, um, in systems engineering. Then this ontology can be used to trace uh, texts with models and models with texts. We can also uh, ensure consistency between texts and models so to make sure that informa the information that is uh, edited in one side of the, uh, so in, in, in the model, for example, is consistent with uh, the information that I uh, documented in my uh, requirement specification in the text. We can ensure completeness by uh, checking in the different sources that we have uh, if we uh, call the relevant concepts in, in our specification. And then we will uh, talk about a tender evaluation process. So to help speed up, as I said, uh, um, the, um, the response to a, tender, uh, to a tender offer. And also finally, uh, how we can extract knowledge from uh, legacy documentation to enrich models, uh, thanks to ontologies. So the first use case uh, basically is to have a uh, um, common framework for, framework for all the system engineering activities. So whatever uh, activity um, activity here could be uh, used uh, to uh, perform any system engineering uh, process. And basically all these activities will be, uh, um, will be uh, around the same uh, knowledge reference, which is the, the ontology. And this ontology, uh, basically is um, is helping all the processes. So um, referencing the uh, systems engineering processes and uh, specifically here, the knowledge management process. If you look at the N square diagram, you, uh, you can see that the knowledge management is linked. Uh, when we think of the out input output uh, of the uh, processes, uh, the KM is uh, linked to all the processes. So it means that knowledge is valuable, valuable and can be used for all the processes. So the more, uh, the smarter the, the way to gather and reuse knowledge is, the better uh, it will be for, uh, uh, to perform different processes. So we need, uh, we need knowledge management uh, to be performed as best as possible and as efficient as possible. 
Here, another example of what we can do to uh, define a common framework is what we call a semantic transformation. So as I said, uh, um, a textual uh, documentation and, um, and a model can be converted, let's say, in a, in a common language that will be representing the information. And we could use either the, um, the requirements uh, specification to, to produce the model or the model to produce the requirement specification. And if you think of uh, variant management to uh, produce a new set of requirements for a new system, uh, we could use a table of properties like this one, then uh, the use patterns to, uh, to feed, uh, fed by these uh, properties to produce a specification. Like for example, for variant B, you could define the requirements uh, for the following properties using a property uh, requirement uh, uh, template here, a pattern and uh, then pro producing this requirement specification. Patterns, again, could be used to uh, help people writing requirements uh, in, a, in, a, in a standardized way to avoid uh, the, uh, some of the main mistakes that we can find in requirements and uh, all of which are uh, covered in the, in the INCOSI guide for writing requirements, like vague terms, like uh, passive voice. So if you use a pattern, uh, here, you don't have the choice to use the active voice, for example, or you cannot, you cannot use a, an indefinite article to, 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 uh, to refer to the system. So these patterns can be uh, powered by uh, model elements. So you could uh, read models to, uh, to write the requirements. So the name of the system or the component that I will be using in the uh, pattern to write my new requirement should come from the model or from the, from the Excel sheet or from the list of uh, needs that, uh, that is uh, mentioned in, in a tender. So any source could be used to, uh, to prevent people from using the diff uh, a different uh, name for the same system. And um, as I said in the beginning, uh, people uh, probably know us more for the quality assessment side and uh, spe specifically to, uh, uh, automate the quality assessment of the requirements. So to verify the quality of the requirements, uh, one of the main reference, and uh, as, a, as it was said in the beginning, one of the main uh, uh, books about, uh, produced by the requirements working group is the Incosi guide for writing requirements. So here uh, I'm referencing to the 2019 uh, version. And basically what we did is uh, process this information into our tool by uh, adopting these three uh, three dimensional uh, quality uh, quality um, assessment uh, process, what we usually call CCC uh, approach, and basically the information, the characteristics, uh, the fourteen characteristics that come from the INCOSI guide for writing requirements, are uh, covered by these three uh, dimensions. In the end, what we did is tailor the uh, rules to create our own sets of metrics, which are uh, implementing with the parameters, the way we should count the uh, errors, the issues that come, uh, that, could, um, that could occur in the, in the requirement. So we came up with uh, 55 metrics in the end. So one metric can cover uh, um, one rule or two metrics or three metrics can cover one rule. So I'm not going to go back in detail about this uh, implementation and how we can tailor. If you want to uh, know more about this aspect, you can watch the, the recording of the uh, uh, RWG uh, general meeting that we uh, that we uh, um, that um, that uh, happened in June of 2020, and we also have a tailoring guide that describes how we uh, did this uh, implementation. Second use case is the uh, uh, traceability between texts and models. So one uh, way to use ontologies is to suggest automatically traces uh, between a source. That could be a text and a target that could be a model or two uh, texts or two models with a different language. One could be an Arcadia, if you think of Capella, and the other one could be SysML or two SysML models. So there's no limit in the, uh, in the uh, difference uh, of kinds that you, can, that you can have between the source and the target. So basically what we do is, uh, in, uh, as I said, ontologies understand and process the information in the source and in the target to present this information in a comparable manner that enables us to uh, use semantics and patterns here to suggest traces. So 
I'm going to show you in this, this short video clip how we can uh, suggest uh, new traces by using the ontologies and the um, and the semantic engine that we have to uh, to understand the requirements coming either from a, uh, a model or a, a text. In this case, I have two different uh, requirements text. And if you look here, I can say that my source is one a module of the doors uh, project and the target can be another module. Here I have a, a statement of work and an, an Excel sheet. I, I will uh, get to this example uh, later. And what we can do is first see that once the ontology processes the information, we can see in a tabular view uh, this information uh, in an in an identical way, so I'm not I'm not making the difference between models and uh, and the textual requirements. Of course, if I if I process a model, I will be seeing the class the the, uh, the of the meta model. If it's a block, if it's a package, if it's a transition, if it's a, a state. So this information is being uh, read, parsed by the ontology, but this will be also traceable to text uh, in the end. So here, um, what I uh, will show is first uh, establishing a transition, uh, um, a traceability between uh, requirements by suggesting uh, that uh, the information is flowed down uh, to the uh, subsystem. So one uh, requirement, uh, one uh, function, one uh, property could be flowed down to, uh, to a subsystem. So in order to detect that, I want the tool to tell me that the semantic uh, in the source is included in the semantic of the uh, of the um, of the target. So what I will do is say, okay, so please uh, detect when the semantic 100%. So that's what I'm saying here. 100% of the semantic of the source is included in the target. So that means that I'm using. Uh, I'm talking about the same system or the same function, and uh, and of course when I talk about the semantic, I'm talk I'm talking about the meaningful words. So the fact that I'm uh, adding uh, an adverb is not going to change anything. It's still going to be the same. So I'm not going to uh, let's say to pollute the trace uh, suggestion just because I have a, a, a added an article or just because I added a, an adverb. It's only the meaningful terms that uh, count here to to suggest the the traces. So here, if I click on suggest uh, based on uh, semantic uh, retrieval, I get two uh, traces here uh, suggested. And what I can do is uh, visualize the trace by selecting. So here you see the couple. This one is talking about the environmental temperature uh, of the competition. So this small system is supposed to compete against other systems and maintain its temperature in uh, in a range. Uh, otherwise, it's considered to, to have lo lost the, the 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 game. Let's say so. Here are the here's the range of the of temperatures. If we go to the target, we can see that uh, this is also the same uh, requirement. So it's not the same wording. It shall be performed. The other one is should take take place. But in the end the meaningful uh, information and the, the, the meaning is the same. So that's why these two requirements are suggested. And we can do this uh, in uh, another uh, for another uh, trace type here. So the trace types can be managed in the ontology. So the ontology can uh, host uh, 100 trace, different trace types if you want to. Here you can select uh, the derived trace types. So in this case, what I, what I want to check is that the um, the state in which the system uh, finds itself is being derived to the subsystem. So if my uh, I want to trace requirements that uh, talk about one particular state for the system and for the subsystem in order to see what, uh, so the fact that one uh, system, the, the main system is finding itself in one state is having uh, an impact uh, on, the on the subsystem. So what I'm doing, going to do is check uh, one particular pattern, which is saying when system is in state. So when system can be any system and is in state can be any state taken from the model, taken from text. Uh, again, you can extract this information from many different sources. And I want to make sure that the state that I detect in this pattern is identical in both cases. So that's what uh, my input parameter to uh, suggest the, uh, the, let's say the, 
the derivation of the requirement from the system to the subsystem. So if we uh, check here the um, this information, we can click on OK. And then uh, basically, uh, if we uh, look at the suggestions, the trace type derives is right here. So this is the derives uh, trace type. So these are the two traces that were just generated with a, a unique identifier. And we can look at the uh, trace to see what happens. So the source here is talking about the ready mode. So this pattern has been detected when the system is in ready mode. So, and I'm going to trace this requirement to a target that is also talking about the uh, ready mode. So this is the, the source and this is the target. And you can see that uh, I'm also talking about the ready mode. This is the subsystem, but the pattern is the same. I'm The subsystem is a system itself, so it's still matching the pattern. And uh, therefore I'm suggesting this as a, uh, as a der derivation of the, uh, of the main system uh, requirement. Another thing that we can do is uh, suspect links between traces. So once you suggest traces, what if I change the information on one side or the other? So here, if I change one word, meaningful word in the source, this might have an impact on this or that uh, element in the model or uh, this or that requirement in the text. So I want the tool to tell me that when I change this requirement, I get a suspect link for uh, this or that element. And in the same way, if I change the model, I want uh, the uh, source to be, uh, I want an alert about the source um, related requirements, the one that were traced before, uh, to, to tell me that uh, there is a change in, on one side, so, so something should be done on the other side. So uh, in this case, I'm uh, connecting one uh, Word document, a project charter, which is defining the goals and objectives of the project and the stakeholder requirements uh, that are stored in, in Excel uh, worksheet. So here I'm connecting two different documents. So one Word and Excel document. So they're textual requirements, but they're defined in different sources. But uh, never mind. this is uh, thanks to ontologies, we will process this in the same way and we can trace this, uh, this, this and that. The other thing the ontologies enable is that this document, I will uh, show you uh, um, a bit how it is uh, structured. We can extract what is relevant for us to be traced. So here, I just want to trace the goals from the project. I don't want to trace the uh, project, uh, the name of the project manager or the date the project should be, uh, should be delivered. This is not the information that I want to be uh, traced. So I can decide, thanks to ontologies, what kind of information I understand. So it's not only uh, absorbing information uh, and keep it for, for reusability, it's also filtering what is relevant for my, uh, for my project. So that's why we usually save time when, you, when, we, when we use ontologies. And in this case, I'm just having seven, uh, six goals and then seven when I will be creating the, the extra one. So in this case, what we do is uh, uh, we have some traces, as, as you saw uh, below. And what we will do is, so you see the document is, is unstructured. It's not just composed of these goals. It's more than that. And what we will do here is add some information to, to simulate the fact that I'm changing information on the source. And I want to, to show how the tool is going to behave in terms of uh, suspecting links uh, to, the, to the stakeholder requirements. So the goal uh, number one is exactly the same, but we add another uh, another uh, uh, element here, which is firmware. So uh, we will see the impact in um, in this one here. In goal number two, I'm just going to uh, change uh, temp here, and instead of writing temp, I'm writing temperature. So you might think it's not the same word, but you you will see. Uh, what the ontology understands. So this is the, the main point. Here I'm changing the structure, should be capable of fighting. I could say uh, shall fight or shall combat in this case. 
to change uh, the, it's changing the structure, the syntax, but it's not changing the meaning. So you will see also how the ontology processes it. And uh, you can also uh, create another requirement. So here, the, the number seven. So here, if you evaluate the suspects here, you will see the, the, the impact on, uh, on, the, on this traceability uh, between uh, the goals and the stakeholder requirements. So once it evaluates the suspects, you can see all the suspect links. So the suspect links are involving uh, one uh, work product in the source and uh, some work products in, in the target. So if, you, uh, if I zoom in here, you can see that there's a small uh, purple uh, dot here, which means that this is uh, suspected uh, to, to have changed. Of course, we included firmware here. By the way, if uh, once you click on the uh, OK button, you can see the new uh, version. Here, so you see that firmware has been added. So you, you update, you refresh the, the content that is read by the by the by the tool, and you have the goal number seven here. So as I said, you have this uh, small dot uh, here that is. Uh, that is uh, displayed. And on the other side, you have also the small dots to show what kind of information has been uh, suspected uh, linked to this, uh, this trace. So all the elements that were traced with the goal number one basically are considered suspect links. And uh, if, if you can see goal number two, you see that here it changed. Remember, we said temp and then we change to temperature. But since temp and temperature are, are being considered synonyms by this ontology, I'm not going to detect this as a suspect link. Same for this, shall combat or shall be capable of fighting would be considered the same meaning. So it's not changing the meaning and therefore it's not going to be suspected uh, in, this, uh, in this traceability and, uh, and so on. So you see that it's not only detecting changes, it's also detecting what matters to the, to the project. Third use case is uh, the fact that we can centralize knowledge, as I said, to uh, ensure consistency between text and models. So in this case, I'm writing a requirement uh, following a pattern of state transitions here. Uh, here, this uh, pattern that uh, is uh, quite close and let's say quite, um, quite um, uh, let's say, uh, inspired by the ears patterns. So uh, my, uh, the next presenter will, will be, of course, will be uh, detailing, uh, giving details about uh, these patterns. But basically, we have a condition, a precondition that is optional here, and um, an action here. So basically, this pattern is making me detecting that this transition is not, uh, is not valid. So with ontologies, I can look into a model and say, uh, what kind of transitions do I have? And then uh, the uh, quality assessment tool here is requesting uh, the information from the ontology to check if this is uh, consistent with the model. So in this case, it's not. So if I, uh, you, you have the uh, warning here on the, on the right side. And if you look at the model, uh, you can see that, uh, maybe you could uh, see it if I zoom in a little bit here, you see that the transition is between normal and fail. So here I say between fail and normal. So this means I'm not, uh, I'm not here uh, seeing it properly. So what I expect is this. And of course, if you change the uh, the, the if you change the order here, you get uh, you don't get any warning, which means that the transition exists in the model, and um, and then you can uh, keep uh, documenting your requirement. You can save it and. And you're uh, on the on, on the right way. What happens if I delete uh, this transition in the model? The next time we will open this uh, this um, window, the warning uh, that we saw before will be also appearing. So the information that we are, uh, this is a dynamic connection. It means that I'm updating the information that I understand from the model, of course depending on what the model is, uh, is stating. So I'm once the model is saved, I get new information. So this is also uh, preventing 
problems with the different versions or the fact that one user decided to save uh, the document. So the ontology is connecting to the last version of the, of the model. If it's updated, then the uh, quality assessment will be updated as well. And then uh, we can go beyond. So I'm not going to uh, talk about correctness because uh, I co uh, we covered this aspect during the RWG meeting, as I was saying earlier in, uh, in 2020. Here, I'm going to focus on completeness to uh, use models to guarantee the completeness of a requirement. So if I have to define the uh, actions that have to be performed um, for each state and each state transition, I want to make sure that they're all in the document. So here I have two uh, requirements. One is uh, linking the normal uh, mode to the fail mode. So we saw that this is not uh, correct, but regarding completeness, of course, it's not going to be, uh, be contributing because it's not a state that I'm expecting. And this one is uh, linking emergency to uh, normal. So in this case, with these two state transition requirements, I'm only covering these, but I'm not covering this one. So fail, uh, emergency to fail is missing, which will be uh, displayed here in the, in the tool. So the tool will be uh, telling you that uh, you have two relationships that were found and another one uh, that was not found, which is also reflected in uh, this part. Basically, you see that we have one instance of normal to fail and emergency to normal, but emergency to fail, which is the one expected, is uh, not in the in the specification. So this way you can guarantee that uh, all the, these transitions are mentioned, and you can also detect how many times, because you could detect uh, two instances, and then it would mean that you're, uh, you might be conflicting, or maybe there are two actions for the same transition, so you have to be careful of the links that we have between both. And, and so on. So this information can be valuable to guarantee the completeness uh, and the consistency also of the, of the full specification. At the beginning, I was talking about also uh, the tender evaluation process. So how we can use ontologies to uh, analyze uh, the uh, requirements, technical requirements uh, in a tender and see uh, how a, uh, a company, a manufacturer can, um, can respond to this tender and um, do it in, in an effective way. So ontologies can be used to uh, analyze all the existing system specification, uh, documents, test cases, models, uh, everything that uh, can bring knowledge uh, that can be reused for the tender. So uh, this helps us defining the system and uh, also defining the, uh, let's say this, the, um, the analysis in the, in the semantic way of the, of the documentation. So we understand uh, the uh, relationships between the, the concepts in the in document. We can understand uh, pro product structures. We can understand uh, state transitions, as I said. We can understand the relationship between an actor and, 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 um, and a function or a capability. So any kind of information that the ontology will be capable of uh, detecting is, is processed uh, here through the, the analysis. And then you can also do the same with uh, the tender by uh, checking uh, here, what kind of information we uh, we find. So the query that we are asking the ontology to perform is basically, do we know these features? So the features that are uh, asked by the 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 the, the, um, the customer uh, here that is uh, uh, that is um, managing the tender is uh, so the th this documentation. What what we're asking is, do we know the features? Um, and do we already have these features in the, our existing system? So if the answer is yes, then we can start traceability the same way I showed earlier by suggesting uh, the functions here that we have in common or uh, using the similarity, uh, how many information included in this or that document is, uh, in, is, um, is pre present in the other one. And if no, um, if you don't have any knowledge of the uh, features in this side, on this side, you can uh, use semantic classification to assign uh, the different um, work products to um, to project teams. So this is the traceability that can be uh, one to n, uh, n to n uh, on both sides, and the role assignment 
will be to say, okay, so there is a requirement about lighting and power consumption. So these should go to electrical engineering team. AC system and power consumption. These could uh, be uh, addressed by both HVAC and engin electrical engineering teams. Weight could be uh, addressed by civil engineering teams and project team here. And the fact that there's a, a due date or a deadline is related to project management. So the understanding of the requirements can be linked to uh, different actors of the, of the project. So you can classify the information, assign the roles just by looking at the information in, uh, in a requirement using the semantic engine and the power of the ontology. And then once you do this with, with one tender, you could easily um, adapt this uh, approach to other tenders. So the, let's say the, the understanding, the way the, the ontology works has been uh, set up for the first one. So the second one is just running uh, the, um, the indexing with another uh, set of documents. And finally, the uh, last um, use case that I wanted to cover is the extraction of knowledge from legacy uh, textual documentation. So as, 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 we, as we said in the beginning, we usually start with uh, natural language, which is, which is our, uh, our main way to communicate. And what we want to do is uh, enrich ontologies by uh, getting the, the relevant information from, from this document and also by helping uh, engineers to design models based on this information. So instead of having to guarantee the consistency, uh, as I presented earlier by uh, managing the, the quality of uh, state transitions in one, on one side and connecting to models, what we can do is helping generate the models from the text. This way, the first uh, instance of the model will be uh, taken from the, from the source without any uh, doubt about the, the consistency. So here you can detect information and run uh, the semantic indexing uh, use the, using the uh, natural language processing technology uh, that we have. And what you get at the end is uh, a list of concepts, uh, relationships, patterns that help uh, defining the, the, the representing the knowledge uh, taken from these documents. This information will be stored in the ontology and the same ontology with this information and other um, other elements that like uh, hierarchies between elements, um, types of relationships, um, the glossaries that you have uh, from your different projects could be used altogether to uh, help transforming this technology, uh, this, um, this information into a, a model in any kind of language, could be CSML, could be Arcadia, if we talk about Capella. And one thing that you could do then in the end is self-learning of the ontology by connecting this ontology to the generating model. So, and then you can repeat the process to mature the ontology. So the maturing of the ontology is a key uh, aspect because the more uh, developed the ontology is, the more powerful the, all the processes will be, uh, all the use cases that I uh, mentioned earlier. And as I said, uh, coming back to the... Uh, the metaphor of, of the compass, if you have a better compass, you will be reaching your uh, uh, end destination uh, earlier than, uh, than with, a, with a poor ontology. But of course, better than uh, with no ontology. So that's a progressive approach that you have to, to develop uh, from project to project by uh, having this ontology learn from the, from the experience. So of course, you can extract information from different sources and have it imported in the ontology as a native information or uh, connecting this ontology uh, through uh, interoperability um, um, uh, connectors to uh, other sources. So as a conclusion, um, I would say that ontologies help merging information from various systems, teams, projects, languages, sources, any knowledge, any knowledge uh, item that you can have in, in a project or in another project could be um, imported or let's say um, captured by the ontology to be used in your current project and for future projects, of course. Ontologies are uh, safeguarding the, the, the integrity of the, uh, of the system development as uh, you use, you're using the same, uh, the same uh, ground for all the activities. So the uh, design engineer is not going to name the system 
another way than the, the business manager did. So if the business manager did call the system system A and the design, design engineer calls it system B, you need either to have a traceability between both elements or you just use one uh, one and uh, only one vocabulary uh, uh, for the for the for the, for this system to be named. Ontologies are easily shareable, so uh, shareable because they're um, supported by uh, databases. We have three databases formats: uh, MS Access, SQL Server, or uh, MySQL. So databases can be shared, and therefore the uh, ontology content. Uh, can be shared uh, in, in an easy way and are reusable. Um, so you can save time by uh, applying the, the concepts that you already uh, used in, a, in another project. And if we couple this with the AI and the NLP, so uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing, we could reach a high level of knowledge maturity. This is basically the last uh, picture that I showed you about the, the self-learning by, uh, by uh, feeding the ontology with the, the learning that, uh, that it helped uh, capturing. And uh, of course, ontologies help avoiding poor requirements management. If you look at the uh, project failure factors from the Stanix Group uh, CARES report, uh, ontologies can help avoiding incomplete requirements, as I said. They can also help uh, classifying information, uh, role assignment, as I said, so you can uh, have a better planning of the project. And also uh, traceability helps uh, managing changing requirements. So you see that summing up all the information you could think of other uh, other applications here that could uh, that could be part of ontologies to uh, to see that uh, ontologies can help avoiding uh, uh, failure in projects. So um, I don't know if there are any questions in the in the chat box. Um, here we have some time for questions, or if you have any reaction, any any anything you would like to comment. Um, now is the time. I only have one question. Um, would you kindly resend me your slides? I don't know if you've sent them to me yet, but I'm I'm not finding them. So, uh, yeah, I will send you uh, the, the slides after the, the presentation. So, could it be a PDF uh, format? Of is course, that, is that okay? That'd be totally okay. fine. And um, for those on the call, I would put them on our Connect site uh, for the IW 2020. There's a bottom library on there uh, for documents. So I'll put it under day two. Thank you so much. By the way, this was a great talk. Um, I really appreciate it. I do want to let others uh, ask questions, though. So I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to others for comments and questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Henrik. Um, uh, just one, one question. Is, is this kind of a little bit of kind of a research uh, stage or is it kind of, has it been used in multiple projects or with, with your customers? Uh, yeah, so thank you, uh, Henrik, for the, for, for the question. So most of the, uh, of, of the um, features that I, that I showed are already uh, uh, developed and uh, used in, in the, in, the, in some of the customers that we have. Um, some of them uh, can need to be developed, like the, the tendering process, for example, that I, that I showed. It was under development with, a, with, a, um, with one of, a, of our customers, but the project got, got, uh, got, um, got canceled or let's say got, uh, got stopped. So, so it may be uh, um, re, um, resumed uh, later, but this tendering part is not, is not, is not developed. But the rest of the, um, of the uh, processes and the features that I showed, the, the traceability video that I showed you, this is already uh, already um, already uh, developed and and, uh, and running. So I don't know what specific aspect uh, you you would be interested in, uh, or knowing if it's, if it's uh, developed or not, or if it's just a general uh, question. No, no, I was just curious a bit on the how mature it was. Uh, so 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 that's good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to have other people weigh in on either just their thoughts, their observations, or questions. Um, love to know what people think about this idea, if they've tried anything similar to this. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes before our next speaker, and I'd just love to see uh, what people are taking away from this presentation. Hey, Lou, I was wondering what you thought. Have you seen anything like this in some of your work as you were uh, investigating your material for the manual? Uh, yes, I'm I'm very familiar with uh, Reuse Company and I've 
worked with him in the past and um uh so uh I don't have any real questions. I've, I've kind of seen a lot of this before. I really like the idea of, of the consistency and use of terminology. When I've re reviewed sets of requirements, uh, it was really obvious sometimes that multiple people had submitted requirements into a requirement set and they use different terminology to mean the same thing. And, uh, you know, that, that really hurts when we're uh, trying to uh, write our requirements, you know, have a requirement set. So this consistency, adherence to the rules in the, the guide for writing requirements really helps with the quality of our requirement statements. Yeah, so just if, if I may, uh, yeah, if I may uh, react to, to, to this, thank you, Lou, for the, for the input. Uh, basically, what I, what I showed is that uh, you can guarantee uh, consistency in the vocabulary so um, you can write a new requirement by following a pattern that uh, suggests you vocabulary and uh, in this case, system names or uh, functions, as I said, any, any kind of object that you may find in, uh, in any source. And of course, if, uh, you're still, uh, if, if you still have um, different uh, names for the system, you, we have kind of a safety net, which would be the, the overlapping uh, metric because we, we can detect similar requirements then when inspecting the requirements in the end of the of the process, so if if there are still, after using everything uh, I showed with the ontologies and the uh, common vocabulary and, and, and so on, if you're still having similar uh, uh, meaning uh, and two different um, names for the same function, we might be able to say these are too similar and you should choose. And in the end, thanks to the vocabulary, uh, the common vocabulary that we have, we could decide which of the requirement is to be removed. So. In the end, the, the idea is not only to have uh, uh, the good uh, vocabulary, but to make sure that we, it only appears once in the in the in the specification. And another thing I really like is um, they have the capability of connecting this to your requirement management tool. So when you're authoring a requirement, they'll actually help you write it well from the beginning. And so. Um, by using the templates, um, having common terms already available to people, uh, it can prevent you writing bad requirements to, to start with. But one thing that's really you know, important is we had a question yesterday concerning um, requirements and models versus textual requirements. Do you need both and all that? And uh, I know Juan Lawrence, uh, is in reuse companies written papers on that saying definitely you still need both. And uh, your requirement management tools allow you to do a lot of things with the requirements that you really can't do within a model, but the modeling tools allow you to do stuff that you can't do in the requirement management tool. So being able to link the two together and then have that real time, almost real time indication if you change in one place um, you need to go look at the other place to keep the consistency between your requirements in the tabular form and the requirement management tool and the requirements in the um, modeling tool. Uh, ensuring that consistency is really vital. So I just really love seeing these kind of tools being developed to allow us to manage using the tool with the best suits the purpose that we're trying to you know, accomplish in that respect. Good. So thank you. Thank you, Lou, for the, the feedback. And uh, yeah, basically, I, I, uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't uh, join the, yesterday's uh, session. So, so I wasn't aware of the, of the, of the debate about the text and models. But as you, as you saw in the presentation, what we, uh, what the, the position we try to defend is uh, we're not saying there's only one side, of, uh, one side of the story. You have to take everything you have and make sure everything is consistent. And if there's a difference, you have to uh, be able to detect it because um, otherwise, if you don't merge this information, if you have both information, you could you could still say that models are uh, a source and the, the text are, uh, are another. But if you don't merge this information, you don't know what is, uh, what is the, the, the priority? What, where is the truth in the end? 
And one way to, def to, to find that, to find the truth is to merge this information. So, so if there are two identical elements on both sides, we know that we're reaching a good level of consistency. But if we have different meanings uh, here and there, then it means that uh, we are, uh, we're not heading to the right, uh, to the right, uh, right direction. So, so yeah, we, we tend to uh, be neutral in, ter in terms of uh, either uh, sources like models, uh, as I said, it could be CSML, it could be uh, Arcadia, it could be any other uh, simulation uh, project, or in, in terms of text, it could be Word, it could be uh, Excel. So what we want is not to uh, um, force people to use any uh, one tool more than the other. You can write requirements or uh, define your model in any tool you, you would like to. The end, uh, the end objective is to make sure that this information will be represented the same way and that uh, if my uh, service provider or my uh, supplier is using a different language or is using a, a different um, a different uh, modeling language um, I'm, I'm I will be able to uh, to understand it the same way or at least relate this uh, different different language or different uh, different uh, tooling with what I'm doing in my in my company so uh, some, we have some example of customers that use in, in a system development process over 60 uh, different tools. If we include all the, 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 the tool sets uh, in, in, in the system development, 60 tools might be a mess when you want to make sure the information is consistent. So, so that's why we, we come up with this neutral and, and what, we, what we call knowledge centric approach. And another thing I really like about you know, like this presentation is it really illustrates why projects need to move from document centric to data centric practices, system engineering, and that none of this capability is possible in a document centric world. It's only possible when we go to a data centric world and maintain that information electronically. So we can, uh, we can try to get consistency across the life cycle in, in all of our artifacts. Hey, Lou, we have a hand raised here. I think, Craig, you had one comment or question before we wrap this one up. Yes, a question. Um, if you're working towards a knowledge centric uh, approach, is the definition of ontology actually represented in your system? Like, for instance, can I go into the system and, and see what is an ontology? What, what makes up an ontology? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Craig. Uh, this is very interesting. I, I didn't mention it, but um, in one of the tools that we have uh, in, in the tool set, uh, we have a tool that is uh, the knowledge manager, which is, uh, the, let's say, the visualization of the ontology. So, you, so it's not just a black box or just a, a, a database uh, full of tables. You, you can see... Um, with a user perspective, with a with a user experience, what the the content is uh, is about. So you can access this ontology and uh, add terms um, manually or importing through Excel. You can define your patterns. Uh, you can write a sentence, and this sentence will be uh, will be uh, processed by the, the natural language processing, and you will get a pattern that is matching this sentence. So if you want to create new templates to uh, write your future requirements. You can write a, an example of sentence that might be your future uh, uh, sample of a requirement, and this would generate your uh, your your template. Or you can do the opposite, as I, as I showed in the um, in the presentation. You can use a template that was previously defined and a table of properties to generate a uh, a set of requirements. So the idea is that uh, the ontology is uh, customizable. And uh, of, of course, you start with a um, with a default database, which includes most of the of the metrics that cover the COSI guide for writing requirements, plus the um, generic vocabulary that you may find in the project. So uh, you don't have to add all the vocabulary of the world. Uh, you only have to add the vocabulary that is uh, that is that has to be controlled for your project. So um, you don't need to add the word uh, I don't know philosophy, for example doesn't mean that if the philosophy word is not in the ontology, it will be detected as a misspelled or, 
or uh, as unknown because it's a, a term that exists in the in the language and the spell checker that works with the ontology so they both work together will say this is a known term so I, I don't need to define it but if you want to define a specific system uh, concept then in this case you would have to uh, populate the ontology with your uh, specific concepts and that's where the connection to models and uh, importation of terms that could be extracted from uh, previous uh, legacy documentation uh, comes in, in play so so yeah yeah there's a visualization of the ontology uh, one of the tools is uh, offering this uh, this capability thank you not only is it uh, uh, viewable but you're telling me it's even modifiable you can modify what the, the ontology yeah. is thank you yeah, and we can even export the full ontology as what we call a library which is uh, like a, um, a file that you generate that can be imported in other ontologies because ontologies can be made of ontologies then you you can have several levels you can have company level uh, department level project level and then one ontology could be imported into the others so that uh, if using a uh, um, configuration management uh, tools or uh, a git or a subversion for example you could uh, use this file to to version it and uh, make sure that everyone in the organization is using the same vocabulary when someone decided to modify it. And uh, we have libraries for uh, um, um, domain knowledge in general, like a space industry. We have uh, some um, libraries that uh, cover the NASA requirements checklist, for example. Uh, we have libraries for patterns. So the, the upcoming presentation uh, about ears is uh, actually a good way to link uh, with, with this presentation because we have one library that implemented the ears patterns so you could use the ears patterns to write new requirements and make sure that you're following the patterns properly so all kinds of libraries can be uh, can be generated and you can generate your own library using the tool hey um we are at time so i yeah. wanted to yeah. give you your virtual round of applause thank you so much uh it was a great presentation and i really appreciate all the work that you put into the the way you communicated this uh it was very clear comprehensible i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording um yeah. and 